see you all and thank you for joining us. I know many of us uh, have family here today visiting as our guests this morning, and uh, we're so glad to see each one of you all now. But I do have to say, I, I don't get to do this very often, and uh, I, I happen to have my dad here, and what a privilege that is. Dad, do you just want to raise your hand so everybody knows where you are? And, You know, the growing up dad <clears throat> never missed a ball game. He was in every, uh, every time that I played trombone, tried to play tuba, uh, he, he was there for everything. And uh, he came all the way up, all the way from Oklahoma just to hear me preach today. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I love you, dad. And, and, and I only get this many chances to embarrass it uh, so often. So. But uh, it's good to see you all this morning. Open your Bible with me to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. And I want to begin this series of messages with you through this book. You all know my heart by now that uh, here and there we may get into a topical series. But my heartbeat is to take a book of the Bible and to begin to ex exposit it, see what's in there, and begin to apply the ancient message for today for us and I and I felt led to uh, begin this series of messages with you uh, from the book of Jonah today I don't know if you are aware of this story uh, but I started praying through this uh, as we approach the end of Philippians and I said God where are we going next and I just really felt led to Jonah and uh, no joke I didn't plan it this way uh, but uh, we made an announcement on, on our social media feed uh, June, June the 9th that uh, we're going to begin this series today. And no joke, on June, the, on June the 11th, two days later, there was some news that made the headlines about a, a story that is almost, almost uh, un unbelievable. And if you didn't know this story, it might, it might be unbelievable. Uh, on June the 11th, there was a self-described lobster man, a, a professional lobster fisherman, if you want to call him that, and he was out scuba diving off the off of Cape Cod, and he told this story. He said, I was out scuba diving, and I was about 40 feet down, when all of a sudden, I just felt this big bump, and everything went pitch black. And in a matter of seconds, I thought, Oh no, I've been bitten by a shark. But he said, I began to feel around and there weren't any teeth and it hit me. It's not a shark, I've been swallowed by a whale. No joke. Real, the, the, I know we start with jokes a lot of times, but this, <laughs> this is for real, okay? This is for real. The guy's in there and he begins to, he begins to describe what happened and what seemed to be and eternity was actually only a matter of a few seconds. And he said, I was down there and everything was pitch black. And I thought my legs were broken. Thankfully, they were just badly bruised. But I could feel around and I realized I got swallowed by this, this well. And I tried to fight loose and then it hit me. He said, look, there's no way I'm going to pry this mammoth beast. I'm not, I'm not going to force his mouth open. And he said, thankfully, my scuba tank didn't get shook loose in all the impact. And I had my air, and I thought I was okay for about that long. And then I said, well, what if this guy goes ahead and swallows me? What am I going to do? Suck air until I just run out of air, and then I'm going to die. And he said, and then it hit me, and all I could think about was my wife and my kids. I thought it was all over. It's his testimony. And then the next thing I knew, there was a sudden upward move that I, I could feel the buoyancy and we were moving upward. And I must have not tasted so good because the next thing you know, that well started shaking his head left and right and he spit me out. And finally, in, in a few minutes, some fishermen nearby rescued me. Now I want to tell you this story, not because it's any more real, than what we're fixing to read. But I want to begin telling you this story because over the years, as we have heard the story of Jonah, many of us 
growing up in Sunday school and in Bible school and hearing it heard in church, it's kind of lost its wow factor. Mm -hmm. What I'm fixing, what we're fixing to dive into today, what, I'm definitely <laughs> into, what we're fixing to get into today is something that God really did in history, in the life of a, of a prophet by the name of Jonah. And I want to get into this because there's a lot of things in Jonah's life that I really believe that the reason God inspired Jonah to write his story, listen, he's the only guy there that would have known about this, to write about it after the fact. This is, this is an autobiography from Jonah's experience, okay? There are a lot of things in Jonah's story, this rebellious prophet and the work that God did in his heart. I believe that God inspired this book to be like a mirror for us. It, it first functioned as a mirror into the life of the people of Israel and how they had forgotten to be a light to the nations. And this rebellious prophet that didn't want to go to Nineveh, uh, no, no surprises, okay, Jonah made it, okay, and, uh, I'm not going to surprise you by that, but he didn't want to go because they were from a different people. They had sinned worse than him. And Israel was in that place having forgotten their call. But as we read this book, it doesn't just tell us about Israel. If we peer in close enough, it really functions as a mirror into our own heart and our relationship with God and our relationship and our responsibility to be a gospel witness to all our neighbors. No matter who they are or what they've done, that God still has a call on His church today to be reminded that the God we serve is a God who loves the nations. He loves everybody and He wants everybody to be brought into right relationship with Him. And today I want to share just a few principles with you about how we can begin to answer God's call. Now we've got, we've, we're going to try to make it through the whole first chapter together today. Uh, so we're just going to take this a, a little bit at a time. But would you join me in a word of prayer before we uh, dig in this morning? God, we come to you together today. And God, we are asking for you to speak to our hearts. Lord, would you open your word? Open our hearts to receive your word. Lord, not only to hear the message, but Lord, to heed it and to obey your truth in your word. God, help us to understand it today by your spirit. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Here's the first thing I want to share with you. We're going to look at the first three verses together this morning. And if you're going to answer God's call, here's the first thing you've got to do. You've got to say yes to God regardless. You've got to say yes to God regardless. Look at these first three verses with me this morning. And the Bible tells us, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. And call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But, verse 3, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. If you want to answer God's call, the first thing that you have to do is you have to decide that no matter what God says to you in His Word, and whatever His will is, that you are going to step out into it and that your answer is already yes, Lord. That should have been Jonah's response. Here he is, a prophet, and yet he was on the run. A lot of times when we think about uh, Jonah, we automatically think about this moment in his life, uh, of this moment of rebellion until God worked in his heart. But there is more to Jonah's story than we find here. In fact, if uh, you want to make a margin of this, in, uh, if you want to make a note of this in the margin of your Bible, jump down 2 Kings uh, chapter 14, verses 23 through 25. 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 and 25. And the Bible tells us this. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he did not depart from the sins of 
his dad, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel a sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord. Watch this, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Ephraim. Okay, a couple of things that stand out and why this is important to us this morning, this backstory of Jonah. If you're familiar with your biblical timeline, it, it, it helps us to understand Jonah's place in history and this moment, uh, how significant it is in his life that when God told him to go to Nineveh, he said, see you later. <laughs> okay? A couple of things. It tells us that Jonah had served uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel, for those of you uh, that may not be as familiar with the biblical history, during the time of Solomon, David's son, because of Solomon's sin and his making treaties with the nations and his compromises in his life, uh, uh, God told Solomon that because of his sin that God was going to tear the kingdom in two. But because of his love for David and because of David's faithfulness, that he wasn't going to do it during Solomon's lifetime. And instead, after Solomon died, there rose up a king, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the first Jeroboam, chronologically. And he rose up and he led the people to make idols of golden calves and to come and worship there. And because of that, then the nation began became split. You had the northern kingdom called Israel, and you had the remaining two tribes referred to as Judah, which was Judah and Benjamin in the south. And from that time on, in their history, they were divided. And Jonah serves in the reign of the second Jeroboam there. But unlike other prophets in history, listen, there, there's three things about, about Jonah's ministry during this time that you need to know. Jonah was serving the Lord during a prosperous time. Uh, they had not, the, the, the Ninevites and the Assyrians, that is, the, the Babylonians had not come in to conquer the land yet. It was a time of peace. The economy was booming. They didn't have war. They were at peace with their neighbors. And look at Jonah's ministry as we find it here recorded in 2 Kings. He was even seeing God fulfill the prophecies that he had uttered. Listen. Who wouldn't want to minister at a time like that? There's peace, there's prosperity, and he is seeing God on the move. But something changed when God told him to go to Nineveh. <laughs> Some of y'all may have been wondering what this thing was back here. When God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, he packed up. And he said, I ain't going to Nineveh. Nineveh's in the east. I'm headed out as far west in the opposite direction as I can. Lord, I'm packing. Go get yourself a different preacher. I ain't going. Because those people of Nineveh, you have to understand, they were a superpower on the rise. Okay? And they were known for their violence and their wickedness and, and, and their ab abuse of the surrounding peoples around them, how they subjugated them to grotesque violence. In fact, the only people in history that compare to them is the Roman Empire who had a road called the Appian Way that for miles leading into Rome, they lined the road with people on cruises, on crosses, having crucified them as a message to those, don't mess with Rome. Well, the Ninevites had a similar road. Instead of crosses, they impaled people alive and left them to die out in the desert. And Nineveh knew how bad they were. And he said, I ain't going. They deserve what they got coming, and I'm not going. And he even tells us later on that, that he knew that if he went to Nineveh, that they would repent. Look at uh, chapter 4 and verses 2 and 3 here with me in Jonah. And listen to what Jonah said. Here, he said, and he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, when the people repented, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when, when I was in my own country? That, this, that That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew, I knew, God, I knew you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting 
from disaster. Here's what Jonah's saying. God, those people are so bad and so wicked. They've done so much wrong. And they deserve what they had coming. And I knew if I went in there, you were going to forgive them when they repented. Now listen. You know what Jonah's problem was? I'm going to tell you. Jonah's problem was the same problem many of us have at different times in our life. As long as we like what the book says, amen. But as soon as God tells us to do something that doesn't exactly fit uh, our, our, our taste, our style, we're like, oh, me. And we don't, we don't heed the parts that we don't like. Jonah had a golden corral theology. I'll take a little bit of this. I'll take a little bit of that. Praise God for that gold, for that fountain of chocolate. You can dip anything in there. Amen. And come back. But I'm going to skip the parts I don't like. That was Jonah's problem. This prophet that received the very word of God. He said, God, those people have done so much bad. I, I don't think that your grace is good enough to cover them. And if it is, I don't, I don't want to go tell them. Historians tell us of President Jefferson, and, and listen, I'm not speaking in, in, in disrepute of our founding fathers. It's just a historical fact that I, that I need to tell you this morning. History tells us about President Tem Thomas Jefferson that he wrote two works on religion during his time. One was the philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth, and the other was the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth, and it was com completed in 1820. But here's what he did. It's a historical fact, okay? He completed his second book by taking the Bible with a razor and cutting out of the Gospels all of its records of miracles, all of its references to the resurrection, all the things that he didn't believe were true. And you say, how could somebody do something like that? I would never do something like that to God's word. Could I tell you this morning, as the Spirit impressed upon my heart, every time we go in willful disobedience, neglect of God's word, when God tells us to do something very clearly and plainly in his word, and we say, no, sir, I don't think so, what we are doing in function is exactly the same thing. And with God, actions speak louder than words. So if we're going to answer the call, the first thing that we've got to do is we've got to say yes to God regardless. Here's the next thing that we need to do. Look at with, with me in uh, verse 4. And I want, to, I want you to see that, listen, we need to answer God's call. Because if you run from God, guess what? You're going to run right into God. If you run from God, you're going to run right into him. Look at verse 4 down to verse 12. And the Bible tells us, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. That is a little g-god, an idol, okay, a false god. And they hurled the, their cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them, uh, trying to do all they could to survive the storm. But Jonah, look at where this preacher's at. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down his life, uh, and, and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came, verse 6, and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise! Call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. I'm in verse 7. Look with me. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and a lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Listen to that first question. It's important. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? Verse 9, and he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made 
the sea, and the dry land. Now, before we finish out those last couple of verses, I want to make a commentary here. They asked Jonah what his occupation was. And as a preacher on the run from God, I believe he was too ashamed to tell them, I'm a prophet, I'm a preacher. Pick up with me in verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. I worked on that all week to get that right. <laughs> tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Verse 13. We'll pick up there in just a moment. Listen. You should answer God's call because if you run from God, you will run smack dab into God. We've got this prophet, this messenger from God who knows who God is, who knows as a prophet what God has written in his word up to that point in history. More than that, Jonah had received direct divine revelation from God for speak, uh, to tell people what God wanted from them. But when he's told to go to Nineveh, he runs from God. And don't miss the irony here. The, the, I, I think part of this was supposed to be humorous, okay? Still, still serious, but still supposed to make a point. His confession to these mariners is, I am a Hebrew, and I fear I serve the Lord God. Now watch this. Who made the land and the sea. And how did he choose to run? With a boat. <laughs> With a boat. Okay? And just how silly is it to think that we could run from God? David said in the Psalms that there is no place in creation that we could hide from God. But notice the emphasis of Jonah's rebellion. He went down to Joppa all on his own. Listen, he didn't take time to pray to discern God's will. He didn't have to. He already knew what God wanted. And he said, I'm going to Joppa anyway. And then he finds a boat, the Bible tells us. So don't misunderstand this. It wasn't like he went down there and he stumbled into one. And he, oh, here's one. No, he, he searched for this puppy out. He said, I've got to go out to Tarshish, which uh, scholars tell us is out in modern day Spain, to the furthest extent of far away from where he had been told to go as he could possibly conceive. This was the end of the world, as far as he knew, to go as far as the other direction from God as he could. And he went down to Tarshish. But thank God. Thank God. And when he was on the run from God, he ran into God. Aren't you glad that God does that for us? There's two theological truths here that we learn, about, and then we'll go on to our next point. But the first thing that we see here in Jonah's life, and one of the most comforting things that we find in this passage of Scripture, is that even when the world around us is chaos, God is still in control. Look at this rebellious prophet doing all that he can to run away from God. And yet God tracks him down and ends up working exactly out to his plan as God had designed it. It's what you need to know about God's will is it works two ways. God either decrees things to happen or he steps out of the way and he allows them to happen for his purposes. But either way, God's will will not be thwarted. He will always accomplish His will and His purposes and we can always trust Him. And God can even use the wrong simple choices of the world to accomplish His good purposes. That's why J Joseph said in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20 to his brothers, he said, you all meant this for evil against me. When you abandoned me, when you went home and you told daddy that a lion had killed me, when you lived and you ignored me, you never searched for me, you meant this for evil against me. But praise God, God meant it for good, for the salvation 
of many. Listen, here's, here's what you've got to know. When you can't, as one preacher said, when you can't trace God's hand, you can always, always, always trust his heart in the midst of your storm. Here's the next thing that you've got to know. And I hope that you hear this one. Because it's, it is possibly the most important thing that God's got me to say this morning. That God confronts us in our sin because of his compassion. Why didn't he just let Jonah go? Why, why doesn't God just let us go our own way when we are living in sin? I'll tell you why. Because the worst thing God could ever do is to just let us go on our way without Him. And because God loves us, He pursues us and He, he chastens us and He disciplines us, not because He's a cosmic bully, but because He is our heavenly Father and He loves us too much to just leave us alone in our sin. Listen, I've got to tell you, friend, God cares for you way too much to just be worried about your, com your personal comfort. He will do whatever it takes to win you back to Himself. If you don't believe me, just look at the cross. You don't think that God won't do whatever it takes to get you back? He gave His own Son for our sin. And he will do whatever it takes. Notice the sailors... They were a part of this plan, but the main object there was a son who was out of fellowship with God. And God saw him out. And the most loving thing that God can do is to confront us in our sin, because to do otherwise would be to deny us as his children. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Listen, the only way for our fellowship with God to be restored is for God to lovingly pursue us and confront us about our sin. When I was a kid, now this was a long time ago, we, we, uh, we had, um, let me be careful how I say this, we, we had this uh, VW bug that is green as the chair you're sitting in, okay? And the starter didn't work in it too much. I remember more than once Dad would have to uh, get out and kind of give it a running start, get the, get the energy going, and then hop in and pop the clutch, and boom, we'd take off, right? Okay. So we had this thing, and it, it was off over on the side of the house. And I, I don't know uh, if it was spring break. I don't remember. It was too, too many years ago. And uh, the, the response to the actions, I've tried to block this memory out, okay? But, but I was out there playing by myself, and some high school kids come by. And there's a great big bucket of white paint, house paint. And these teenagers convinced me that it'd be real cool to give Daddy's VW bug a new paint job. Well, you know, those boys weren't around when Daddy found out about what happened. And they weren't really his concern. You know why? Because they weren't his kid. And because Dad loved me enough that he knew that I had to change course or I'd end up somewhere worse. He confronted me, I'll just put it that way, about my sin. Because he loved me. And our Heavenly Father will do the very same thing. No matter how far you run, you cannot run too far. God will win you back to himself. He will pursue you in his love and he'll do whatever it takes to win you back. Here's the last truth I want to lay on you this morning and, we, and then we've got to go this morning. But look at these last few verses, verses 13 through 17. And I want to tell you that here, if you want to talk about answering God's call, you can always answer his call because redemption is always, always available. Look at verses 13 through 17 with me. And the Bible tells us, nevertheless, the men rode hard. Let, listen, just let, let me pick up where we left off. Jonah said, just throw me overboard. I don't know about you, but if the lot had been cast, and he had even confessed to himself that he's the source of the problem, I might have gone, whoop, <laughs> overboard with Jonah, but not these guys. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. 
for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. See why I had to practice with that? Uh, against them. Therefore, they called out. They called out. They called out to the Lord. O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Like immediately. Immediately. Verse 16, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed, verse 17, a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And we can just pull over here and say, regardless of what your translation says, if God wanted it to be a well, it was a well. Amen? And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. You can answer the call because of redemption is always, always, always available. No matter how bad you've blown it, no matter what you've done, Grace is always available. It's got to be one of the most ironic scenes in the Bible. Let me tell you why. Here's this prophet. He's in out and out rebellion against God. He's on a boat with a bunch of idolaters that don't know God. God brought the mission field to Jonah. Okay, Jonah, you don't want to go to Nineveh. I'll bring the mission field to you. Israel's called to be a light to the nations. He's a prophet. And yet Jonah's heart was so hearted, I believe, against God and God's will that he slept through a hurricane force storm. Listen, it's not just because he was a sound sleeper or because he had a snoring problem, okay? Jonah was resting on his blessed assurance and giving God the silent treatment. And these men did everything they knew. Look, look at the progression of what happens here. Jonah's asleep in the storm. And the first thing they do is they throw over their goods. Because when you're in a storm, it doesn't matter how much of this world you've got. It's never going to be enough to answer the real problem you've got. And so the first thing to go was their material goods. And then when that didn't solve the problem, look where they turn next. They turn to their idols. They turn to their gods. But no matter how much they prayed, no matter how many times they went back to them, the things that they had trusted in couldn't fix their problem. And so as a last ditch resort, notice the progression. They give up and they go get Jonah. And they said, what are you doing? How, how can you sleep through this? Listen, some folks can sleep through anything. Amen? They say, how can you sleep through this? Get up and pray to your God. And listen, don't miss this, okay? This is so vitally important. They are not saying, you go call on your God, we're going to call on our gods at the same time. They're saying, no, Jonah, we've tried everything else. We don't know what else to do. Maybe if you call on your God, maybe he'll answer and spare us. And this is exactly where I think so many people are at. So many people we love, maybe some of us here today, we turn to everything else first. Try to handle it ourselves first. Now God is telling some of us what's keeping you from turning back to me. Because if you will turn to me, I will show you my faithfulness. And no matter how big the problem is, I can fix it. Because I'm the answer to every question you've got. I'm the solution to all the problems you've got. I am the Savior you need. Well, that was just a sidebar. Let me tell you why this is so ironic. This preacher of the good news with the mission field right there. Jonah, for all he knows, isn't really going to die. Apart from the Lord, this preacher. And yet he doesn't have the compassion to tell them how that they can come into a relationship with God. Instead, he just says, throw me overboard. Listen, I have to break it to you. I don't believe Jonah's the good guy here. Not yet. There's more to his story. God's going to do a work in his heart. But I believe Jonah is still so hardened. And this is still wet cement for me, okay? We can agree, talk about it after service if we need to. But I still, but I believe that in this moment, Jonah is still so hard-hearted against the people of Nineveh. 
And he said, I don't care if I'm going to die. I ain't going to Nineveh. There's my golden pass out of here. And look at what God did though. In the midst of this, God moved in mercy to start a revival that would touch the nations despite this preacher's insolence and incompetence. But that's not the end of the story. It's no accident that this well was here on this day. Did you read that passage with me? It said, God ordained. God sovereignly moved. He had this whole thing planned out ahead of time. He already knew the decision Jonah was going to make. And he knew, I've got to send a, a whale here. You know what the whale's name was? I know what it was. It was Romans 5.8. Even while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jonah, in the midst of his rebellion, in the midst of his sin, God not waiting for him to repent yet, but demonstrating his love and his mercy in the midst of his sin when he was caught red-handed. He sent a mobile mercy unit to Jonah. And you're going to read in chapter 2 that while he's in that fish for three days, that then he humbles his heart and he repents and he is restored to God. I was so glad, I'm so glad that he did that for us, that even while we were still in the wrong, that he sent Jesus to make everything right through a relationship with him. Yeah. God gave Jonah a second chance because of grace, and that same grace is still available today. You say, how do you know that, preacher? I know because Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40 that this scene in Jonah's life, that Jonah himself was a picture of Jesus. You say, how is it that God could forgive a sinner like Jonah out and out, living in broad daylight in sin against God? The same way He forgives all of us. Just as Jonah was in the belly of that whale for three days and three nights, Jesus told us in the New Testament that He was a picture of what Jesus would do when He would go to the cross and He would be laid in the tomb for three days and rise on the third day for the forgiveness of our sin. God can forgive us because He laid our wrongs on Jesus who never sinned, who always did everything right, and who died as a payment for us and who has risen again. I think it works like this. Back in the day, we used to have these things on the street corner. There was a metal box. It had a long silver cord. and had a black handle that you could pick up and put up to your ear. It was a payphone. Y'all remember that? They used to have those things. And if you were in trouble, didn't matter where you were, you could go to the payphone and you could make a call back home. Didn't matter if you had enough to cover the charges or not, because you could do this thing that they call a collect call. Amen? Amen. Amen? You would pick up the phone and you'd say, I need to get connected back home. And the operator would get you connected and uh, dad or somebody might pick up the phone and say, who's calling the operator telling you getting a call from so-and-so? Do you accept the charges? And because of love, they foot the bill. And I want to tell you that at the cross, that is what Jesus Christ did for us. And it doesn't matter how much wrong you've done, how bad you've blown it, his payment is sufficient. Here's all he's asking to do. Come on. Do you need to make a call to heaven today? To turn? Maybe you're here today and you would say, you know what, preacher? I, I'm sure that I'm, that I'm a believer. I took care of that a long time ago. And if I die today, I know absolutely I have peace in my heart. I know where I'm going without any doubt. I'm so grateful for that. Could I ask you, is there an area of your life where you're not totally surrendered, just like Jonah? Where you need to come and you need to say, I need to surrender. I need to repent of something that is going on in my life, an attitude, an action, a behavior, something. I need to come lay it down today, and I want to be restored today. If that's you here in just a moment, our instrumentalists are going to come, and we're going to have the time for you to do that today. But here's the most important thing that you need to do. 
If you're here today and you would say, man, that sounds great, that assurance, that peace in my heart, sounds wonderful, but, but honestly, I don't know. I don't know with absolute assurance in my heart. If I was to die, that I would go home to be with the Lord. Now, I don't know that there's a place waiting on me because I've never, I can't think where there has been a definite moment in my life where I have turned from my wrong and put my hope and all my trust in Jesus. Listen, God brought you here today to take care of that today. Would you stand with me as we prepare to come? Here's all you need to do to take care of that today. Simply admit to God. Say, God, I know I've done wrong against you. I believe that Jesus paid my bill. And I need his forgiveness. And if you say something like that from your heart to God today, he will save you today. And then you need to come forward and make that decision public. Nobody here is going to think a thing about your decision. We're just going to rejoice in the work that God has done in your heart together this morning. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. 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 We're going to have a word of prayer. God's speaking to you today. You come. You come. Jesus, we come to you and we pray now. God, would you move by your spirit? Restore children of yours to fellowship with you today, God. Those that are here today that would say that I know that I know that I have believed that there's stuff in my life that has gone wrong and I want to be restored. Lord, would you bring them back to yourself today? And for anybody here that needs Jesus for the very first time, God, would you move on them right now, right now, and trust in Him as their Savior. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You come. You come. I want.
We didn't fare too bad for a whole chapter of preaching today. Held you all up just a little bit. That's okay. Then. You got the evening off. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so glad to see you all. This. Look at this place. This could be every week. Amen. Full. Okay. We are so glad that you're here this morning. Let's have a word of prayer and we're going to be dismissed. Uh, Brother Larry Russell, I'm going to call on you this morning. Would you mind? Thank you, sir. Heavenly Father, the Lord, we just uh, thank you for the day that you've given us the opportunity to come out and hear your word. 